Good morning, and welcome to Vigilant Broadcasting. The Station Opportunity presents Underneath the Hat with your host, Arthur Cherie Simmons, as she discusses topics to help us all take care of ourselves underneath the hat. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Underneath the Hat, an affiliate of Vigilant Broadcasting and the Talk Radio and TV Network, LLP. My name is Cherie Simmons, your host. I apologize for the voice. I'm dealing with the cold, but we will get through it anyway. And so today's topic will be mother-daughter relationships with my guest, Mrs. Claudia Parker. If you're on Facebook, you can tune in now at Talk Radio TV Network, LLP, or you can call in to discuss our topic at 319-527-2634. If you're on my page underneath the hat or Cherie Simmons, just click the link that I shared this morning and join us. Well, our guest today is Claudia Parker. Most people describe Claudia as a personable free spirit that's full of energy. This hobby is turned professional after her career in journalism produced numerous front page newspaper and magazine publications. Her photographs have been featured in The Reporter, Regional News, The Chicago Sun-Times, Special Parent Magazine, Family Time Magazine, and more. In addition to journalism, Claudia gained a wealth of experience as a photographer in the K-8 school district before launching her own business. She has an MBA degree from St. Xavier University, and she's happily married with two daughters. She's also the author of Becoming a Mother While Losing My Own, which is based on the topic that we're going to discuss today. And she has her YouTube channel, Five Minutes of Faith, which we will dive into later on today. So let's all welcome Mrs. Claudia Parker. Hi, Claudia. How are you? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for being here. So I met Claudia through uh, her husband, actually. It was funny because he saw me (laughs) post on someone else's page, and I didn't know him, but he was advocating for his wife. I was like, okay. So when I finally talked to Claudia, she was like, yeah, my husband does that a lot. But listening <laughs> to her story, I was like, I definitely need to have her on. So she's since been on my panel, my underneath the hat panel about mother-daughter relationships, and that went so well, I decided, now let's bring her to the radio show. So thank you so much for agreeing to come and share your story once again. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. All right. So let's dive right in. Tell all of us about your mother-daughter story. All right. It is a complex (laughs) conversation. Let's see. Where do we want to begin? I will tell you that growing up with my mother, Up until the age of seven, I recall having a very tip what I would what I would consider a typical mother daughter relationship. I remember um, us going to church every Sunday and Wednesday and even Friday nights. We were um, a a family that was full of faith, and Mm -hmm. my mother loved the Lord, and we were in church all the time. That's a lot of our stories, right? And I remember inside of the home having chores to do and, you know, being well kept as far as what my hair looked like and what my clothes looked like. And, you know, I felt like I had a good mom. I felt well taken care of and cared for. Um, Mm. And then tragedy struck. Uh, I had, at the time, there were four. I have four. Well, there were four of us. Mm -hmm. I had three siblings, um, a two-year-old sister, a six-month-old sister, and then I was seven, and then my older sister was 10, and we were outside playing, and my little two-year-old sister was struck by a car and killed. 
Wow. And from that tragedy, my mother um, just did not recover from the grief of losing a child. And mm-hmm. she fell into a deep depression that then snowballed into substance abuse and alcoholism. And ultimately, she, she just kind of like deteriorated in her health. And she died at the age of 52 from congestive heart failure. Wow. So how did you feel as a little girl going through this journey? So, and as a child, I didn't understand why my mother was so sad over losing one of her kids when the rest of us were still there. That's how mm-hmm. I felt in my seven-year-old mind, eight-year-old mind, nine-year-old mind, ten-year-old mind. When is my mom going to come back to us and function right. like she used to because we're still here? As a child, that's how I felt. And then um, she dealt with a lot of um, judgment and condemnation from the community as well as the church because um, we were poor, we lived in the projects, we were, um, she received all kinds of government aid, we all had different fathers, so there was a... Uh, a condemnation that came against her, well, some of her circumstances are due to her. Mm. You know, she she can't get it together, and she done had all these babies, and she doesn't have the ability to take care of them, and they all got different baby daddies, and, you know, she she has uh, made this bed that now she has to lie in. So from the scrutiny from the people that were judging her, I didn't realize at the time I was doing the same thing because in my mind I was thinking, why come my mom can't get it together? Why is my mom yeah. always embarrassing me? Why am I the child that has last year's clothes on or doesn't have school supplies on the first day of school? You know, I felt angry at her and ashamed of her, and I condemned her in my own way just like they did. I was angry at people for how they treat my mother, but then – in, in hindsight, I had done the same thing mm. until I came to, to know Christ on my own. So we can go to church all of our lives yeah. and, not, and not ever know who God really is, not, mm-hmm. and never know who he, how, how to have a relationship with us ourselves. And I was in that place until I was, how old was I when I received Christ? Twenty. One, twenty-two. I was twenty-two years old. Yes, and then I, when I received Christ for myself, and then I started to understand what it meant to have a relationship with the Lord. Then it was like, oh, you mean to tell me that receiving uh-huh. Christ doesn't mean that um, if I don't follow all of the rules in the church, I'm going to hell? You mean there's grace? You mean there's mercy? Uh-huh. You mean there's a a loving God? You mean he's compassionate? Yeah. That part I never got mm-hmm. until I came up underneath that doctrine that, of religion that I was exposed to as a young child. I was removed from that. And then I started to see my, my mother in the light that I felt like Christ was seeing me in now that I – was born again and I received Christ and was experiencing the relationship with Christ I had never known from the, the religious church that I was in as a child. Mm. And then my, our relationship began to heal when okay. I grew up. Mm. Now you mentioned, it's funny you talk about being in the church but not knowing him. I did a Facebook Live Thursday and talking about my book underneath the hat, I was saying how I had idolized my first husband. And people were like, what do you mean? That's wrong. And that's not what the Bible says. And I'm like, I understand that now. But <laughs> and I, was, I grew up in the church from the time I was 10 years old. But I didn't form a relationship with him until I had gone through this issue of 
idolizing man, and he had to pull my coattail and say, this is not right. I have something bigger and better for you. So how did you deal with people who didn't understand how you felt towards your mom within the church? By the time I had grown up to a place of treating her badly, I I wasn't even aware because I wasn't in the church anymore. I had backslid, and I was happy to be um, living in a life of sin. And you want to know why? Because my mother had backslid too. Okay, so we went through the whole tragedy thing. She went and Mm -hmm. sought counsel from people who she felt – that she had a high she she held these people in high regard. So it wasn't mm-hmm. the pastor of the church. Um, it was it was more so friends that she had in the church, people that she looked up to, and the counsel that she received was that you know this is this is the consequences of your sin. You know you mm-hmm. your marriage has dissolved and you've lost your child as a result of your own doing. This is God correcting you. He's trying to set mm-hmm. you on the right path. He's right. trying to get your attention because of the way you're living. So, you know, I mean, who who keeps going to church after that? Well, I tried Jesus, and that ain't working uh-huh. out too good, so let me try Jen. So she right. starts drinking. So then when we, st- she, you know, we put the caboose on all that going to church, it was a relief for a preteen. Thank goodness. I don't ever want to go back to church again because I'm, all my time is wrapped up, and then I don't have to deal with these crazy, judgmental, condemning people. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I went all throughout my teenage years and my early adult life, like I said, until I was 22 before mm-hmm. I came back to Christ. So whatever they were saying <laughs> about me, yeah. I had no idea because <laughs> mm-hmm. I wasn't there anymore. I was living in the streets, making all kinds of poor choices for myself and putting yeah. myself in a lot of precarious situations that came back to bite me later on as an yeah. adult. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So did you ever talk to your mom? about how you felt? Yes, but not in an appropriate way. You know, when I was talking to her about my frustrations, it was more so coming out of anger. Uh And so I would tell you that our relationship was very volatile. You know, we would have these bouts of me expressing my frustration and then her to check in me like, excuse me, who do you think you're talking to? I'm your mom. I put my fist down your throat. Right. Um, and then it was like, okay, well, you know what? I don't need to deal with you. And then we have, we have these sabbaticals where I wouldn't even talk to her or see her because I was the kid that stay with their grandma for a little bit and then stay with their auntie for a little bit. And then went stay with friends for a little bit. I was the hopper. I was doing anything okay. I could to escape my home environment because we were poor and we would mm-hmm. get evicted from different places. And then we would go stay with this. Part. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm about to go stay with somebody else. So I don't have to be um, the person that is at home when the sheriff comes with the shotgun to put all of our stuff out on the curb. Mm. Now you may so, be in a hopper. Cause I was yeah. one to, I I ran away because my mother, she got married when she was in her 20s after she had had my brother, and then her and my dad got divorced because of his drug addiction, and then she remarried my stepfather, which was the worst time of my life, and so I ended up leaving, move, leaving there and moving with my first husband. I lived with him for a year with him and his family because of all the the issues that were going on at home with me. So how did being a hopper help to mold you into the person that you are today? Because so many people end up going from one place to the other and feel as though that there's no way for them to become great because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
So how did the experiences you had as a hopper help you to be who you are today? You know, it just taught me to be extremely independent. Uh-huh. Um, I because when you when you feel like you're a guest in all these yeah. different residences, you want to you you know I whatever whatever space I was given, whether that was a bedroom or just a sofa or you know a cot, wherever I was, I felt like okay, I need to be um, mindful that I am in someone else's space, so I'm going to be neat. I'm going to be respectful. I'm I'm going to clean up after myself, you know, try to, try to make as minimal waves as possible because I don't know how long I need to be here. So I need to be responsible with whatever that I'm being entrusted to in this, in this time and in this space. I, and then also it made me feel as though, um, where do I fit? You know, where do I really Mm -hmm. belong? If, if I, if I'm a guest everywhere where do I really fit? You know, what's, what's the place that I'm really supposed to be? It almost puts you in a place of um, insecurity, of, yeah. of not having that sense of, you know, your, your, your basic needs not being mm-hmm. met, of a, a sense of belonging and a sense of fulfillment and a sense that you are really truly contributing back into a family yeah. or society. You know, I felt like my... Um, I didn't feel stable, you know, for a long time. So there, there was a distrust um, yeah. in, in a sense of my own self for many years. As now how it pertains to being adult today, I feel like I am the person who, because I had little hope, always wants to pour that hope back into others. That's who I am today. That's what it's done for me as an adult, as Claudia today in my life. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of reasons why people should feel hopeless and and Mm -hmm. destitute and and down and out. But I Mm -hmm. have experienced a whole lot, (laughs) and I've been in a lot (laughs) of precarious situations. And, and, and places where people would have, you know, shook their head and be like, ooh, I really wouldn't want to be you, you know. Right. And I have, you know, sprung forward through the cracks of the cement and, and, mm. and manifested in something that is beautiful and wonderfully made in Christ. So there, there absolutely is hope. And so that's what I do today. I try to extend the hope um, that the Lord has given me through through testimonies of faith. Yeah. Now, you said that you were moving from place to place. Did your mom ever come to your rescue? Did she finally just say, hey, I need you home? Because I never got that from my mom. When I moved to I, you know what? with my, go ahead. You know, I I was just going to piggyback on that. Like, I wish, I wish you would have, you know. I, mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, there was so, there was so many times in my life where I was so happy that we were mm-hmm. having an estranged relationship because I could do what I wanted. I was a teenager and I could, and I could get involved in whatever I chose to do. Now, right. I'll say this. let me just regress for a second. Because I had the freedom of doing whatever I wanted to do, a lot of times I didn't even choose to do it. So, mm. so many times our kids rebel because they feel trapped in, I can't make any decisions for myself, so I'm going to go as far away from what my parents are, are guiding me to do just so I can feel like I have some autonomy. Um, right. I, I was the kid that if I wanted to get high, I could get high, so I never chose mm-hmm. to do any kind of drugs. I could drink mm. if I wanted to. I chose never to drink. I was the designated driver for my ki- for my um, my peers whose parents had cars and they would let their kids take the car. They y'all get drunk. I want to drive because my my right. mom don't need a car. I, I don't know what to, to drive a car. So that was what was fun to me. Let me drive. Y'all get blamed. Right. So um, so so I I did because I did have the foundation of Christ and I was exposed to the Holy Spirit, 
Mm-hmm. It was really a compass inside of me that I didn't even know was guiding me away from choices that could have really, you know, had me end up in some mess. I still made yeah. bad choices, and I still dealt with consequences, but it wasn't as severe, I think, as it would have been had I not had the foundation of, the, of being exposed to the Holy Ghost from a very young mm. age. Um, yeah. Okay, so now go back to my mom um, pulling me in. There, there were times when I was like, okay, I, I'm, I'm done being rebellious, and you know, I, I'm ready for somebody to care about where I'm at and what I'm doing and, and say, mm-hmm. I, you know, come back home right now. I miss you. I love you. I want you here. And, and she didn't. And, and, mm-hmm. and I, it wasn't because I wasn't loved, but it was because she was so caught up in her own depression and her own defeat, defeatist life mm-hmm. that she didn't have it. She didn't have it in her to come for me. And so, again, that fed back into my um, feelings of insecurity and a life of rejection that I had to move past, feeling as though there was nobody in the world that cared about me. Mm. And I felt the exact same way. I, I actually, my mother and I finally got to a point recently where, our relationship has improved because I felt like she had chosen her second husband over her kids. And we never Mm -hmm. dealt with that until we were grown. But now going through the things that I went through with my first marriage and being in a relationship and having to make choices that other people may not understand, I started to have compassion for the choices she made that I didn't get as a kid. I had to go through those things as an adult to understand where she was coming from. She couldn't just leave her husband without at least trying, even though things were showing that he wasn't the best person for her. But then I also had to understand that there were some insecurities in her that she hadn't dealt with before going into this marriage for the second time. And Mm -hmm. those things came through in the, the choices and the decisions that she made, which ultimately helped to mold me into the decisions that I made because I saw her make them. So you have these girls out here who don't understand why their mother is making these choices and they won't understand until they get into those situations as well. But like you said, if it wasn't for that foundation and that base that we had inside the church, we would be in different situations too because I was in the church from the time I was 10, got married in the church, was active in the church on every ministry possible that I could be in, but I, I didn't have a strong relationship with God. I knew who he was, but he wasn't totally in my heart until all of these things started happening with my first husband and God had to say, look, I have a bigger purpose for you I need you to get your stuff together. And just like you, my father was addicted to drugs. I had family members that drank. I was like, I don't want to do all that because I know what it looked like. (laughs) I knew it was a bigger purpose for me, but I just didn't know what it was. So I'm not a designated driver. I don't even drink that much now. I might drink, what, two, three times a year because I've seen the effects of it. So it was interesting to hear you say that, given the background of your mother and the um, substance abuse that she dealt with, that that was not your choice. So why do you think that is that you have some people who go in the opposite direction of what they may have seen growing up? Uh, Clarify. Mm. Clarify. Oh, as far um. So you and I, we both saw people with substance abuse issues. Mine was drugs. Yours was uh, alcoholism. Why do you think you went in the opposite direction of not wanting to go down that path that you saw your mother go in? Because you have some girls that feel like, uh, this isn't for me, but this is all I know. Right. Right. And I feel like... You know, I have several siblings, and Mm -hmm. the courses of our lives, some of them 
because they did witness my mom in slumps of depression and, you know, being drunk in a stupor, like that is the path that they followed because that is what they knew. Mm -hmm. I had a different foundation. See, they were, well, one of them was just an infant and the other one wasn't even born yet. So the mother that, the only mother that they knew was the mom that was drunk and getting high Mm. and, you know, Mm. living in a, in a slump of depression. That's the only mother they knew. But I Mm. grew up knowing a mother that loved the Lord, that was, Mm. that knew the Bible, that was in the church with her hands raised up, received, you know, laid out in the spirit. That's the mom that I was exposed to first. And okay. so that is what held on to me because I always knew two different options. And even though we were in um, the projects and poor, I, my mom had a strong faith. Like I remember one time the phone being disconnected and she pulled the cords the so you know a long time ago when we had regular telephones <laughs> yeah. and it would be um so you know obviously if your phone is disconnected you don't need to have it plugged into the wall right so the the phones right. had been uh in the closet upstairs and i remember mm-hmm. one day she said i want we're going to get these phones back on and um she said i'm going to go down to it was called Indiana Bell because I'm from Terre Haute, Indiana, and that was the phone company okay. thing. She said, I'm going to go down to Indiana Bell, and I'm going to talk to these people and get the phones back on. So she said, Claudia, go upstairs and get those phones out of that closet. Tell me to get the phones and plug them up. There was two different outlets. There was an outlet upstairs, and there was an outlet downstairs, two phones. She said, go get them phones and plug them up. And I was thinking, Mom, you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to plug up the phone. <laughs> you know, Goodwill, you ain't got the money to pay that bill. Right. I did what she said. I went and got the phone, plugged them up in the wall. Then we got a little taxi because we didn't have a car. Got in a taxi, went down to Indiana Bell to, mm-hmm. uh, so she could talk to these people about the phone. Well, this was right in a phase where Indiana Bell was being bought out, I want to say, by AT&T. Mm-hmm. It was during the transition. So she goes in to talk to them about getting the phone reconnected, and they are um, trying to pull up the account, and they can't find the account because they're being transitioned into AT&T. So okay. they were like, ma'am, we're sorry. We, we cannot – we cannot find the account that you're referencing to, but if you want to apply for a phone, here's the paperwork. So the debt was canceled and she ended up applying for a new account and the phone was turned back on. Right. So I saw that level of faith and I'm just like, oh my, (laughs) how Mm -hmm. did that happen? Like she just knew, you know? So I feel like yeah. I was able to, because I saw that, I was able mm-hmm. to start exercising little areas of trying that for myself. You know yeah. what I mean? Throughout life when I would find us, find my, myself as a young adult in situations where I was like, ooh, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Well, let me try what my mom did. You know, I've seen her right. do this and I've seen her do that. So even mm-hmm. when I wasn't, even before I had surrendered my whole heart to the Lord, because we serve such a great God, and he's yes. our father, even when we don't see him as ours, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, he, miracles would manifest in my life even before I had prayed the prayer of salvation. So I knew yes. God mm-hmm. was real. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's so funny that you say that because that was one of my questions, thing, things in your mother or things from your mother that you still possess, and you talked about having that faith walk. And with my mom, it's the work ethic. Like, I remember mm-hmm. seeing her get up. She worked downtown at Life and Griffin, and she would get up with her stockings on and her white socks on top of them with her gym shoes on, <laughs> and she had her heels in her bag. It was a law firm. And I would see her get up every morning and go to work. 
and my dad was with us at the school, and he made sure we ate and did homework, and then she came home and prepared for the next day. So I saw that um, work ethic and self-determination from her, which drives mm-hmm. me to do all the things that I'm doing today. So even in the midst of the turbulence and the trials and yes. tribulations that we had with our moms, there were still some yes. good things about them that helped to mold us as the women that we are today. But I'm going to break yes. right here because the conversation has gotten good. So for those of you that are listening on Facebook, you can go to Talk Radio TV Network, LLP, and hit the link, or go to my page, Cherie Simmons, or underneath the hat, and link in so you can tune in with us. Or you can call in if you have a question for Claudia or myself, or just want to talk about mother-daughter relationships. Call in at 319-527-2634. We'll take a commercial break, and we'll be right back on Underneath the Hat. Okay, do you want me to mute my phone now? Mm, No. Just unmute it. Welcome back. This is Cherie Simmons, the host of Underneath the Hat. Sorry about my voice. I'm dealing with the cold. We are an affiliate of Vigilant Broadcasting and the Talk Radio and TV Network, LLP. Our topic today is mother-daughter relationships with my guest, Claudia Parker. On Facebook, you can find us at Talk Radio TV Network, LLP. I've also started a watch party on my page, Cherie Simmons or underneath the hat, so join us there. And if you want to call in and be part of the discussion on mother-daughter relationships, call in at 319-527-2634. So I'm here with my guest, Claudia Parker, the author of, tell them about your book, Claudia. It's Becoming a Mother While Losing My Own. Yes, and we've had some great conversation so far. So let's continue to dive back in. Now, when we left for a break, we were talking about the different traits that we possess from our mother. So how has your experience with your mom helped to shape you as a mother? 
as a mom, oh my gosh, the thing I love about my mom is in how she um, parented us. You know, sometimes you hear it when there's a parent that has multiple children, how they have a favorite. Uh-huh. And my mom really didn't have a favorite. I mean, really? at the time of her passing, there was five of us. Okay. Four sisters and one brother, and then, of course, there was the sixth one is the one that was deceased. But mm-hmm. she didn't have a favorite from all of us. She loved each one of us for our different positive attributes, and she saw yeah. variations of herself in each one of our positive attributes. Mm-hmm. And And she would always make us aware of what those things were. She was so... Um, affirming of who we were. All the, like I feel like when our relationship got good, and I actually stopped judging her and allowed allowed her love because I think that's what I was doing. I was I was so angry with her that I was pushing her away, so I wasn't even able to see how much she loved yeah. and cared about me until later. And then when I mm-hmm. started experiencing her as a person. Then I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's just so amazing. Like, I, um, the thing I miss most is how, how much, she, you know, it's like she was like my number one fan. And then I look at, mm-hmm. you know, some of the choices that some of my siblings have made and think, geez, you know, mom, how do you celebrate that? But she did. <laughs> she right. did. You know, she loved each one of us equally. And because of that, you know, all of us have had a hard time. I mean, she, she passed away in 2008 and that's, mm-hmm. a, that's 11 years ago, but we all still yeah. have a hole in our hearts and, and miss her terribly because she filled uh, places in us as people that y- you can't get back once you lose your mom. Yeah. So how do you go about honoring her? You said it's been 11 years. What things do you do? to make sure that you keep her legacy alive? You know, it, it came through writing the book, but mm. I, didn't choo- I didn't choose really to write the book. I will tell you quickly how that happened. Um, you know, after she died, it was, a, it was a tragedy. You know, we lost her at Christmas mm-hmm. time. And, okay. um I was the one that had the insurance policy on her. So, therefore, I lived in Chicago, and this was a week before Christmas, and she is in Terre Haute. And since I was the one that had the ability to pay the funeral directors, they only wanted to deal with me. So we had to, when I say we, my husband and I had a little 15-month-old baby at the time, we had to travel to Terre Haute, but it was in the middle of an ice storm. And so it was very difficult for us to get down there. Once we got down there, everything stopped. The, like they, they shut off the interstates and everything. It was just that bad. Like it was uh, catastrophic problems everywhere from all of this ice. So we ended up uh-huh. getting stuck in Terre Haute for an entire week. We didn't bury her until December 26th because nobody could have, between it being Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and and the ice storm, we couldn't even, nobody would even be able to get there, you know. So long Mm. story short, by the time we got back to Chicago a week later, our house was destroyed. While we were away, Pipes had frozen and burst in three different places and caused catastrophic damage to our home to the place where it had to be ripped out down to the studs and rebuilt. Wow. And our house was new construction. We had just had it built three years before. So when you have a new house, you have new stuff. So all of our furniture and talk about, you know, computers and TV. I mean, I even had mold growing out of the shoes that was in a closet. Wow. So we um, had to move into a hotel. We didn't have to move mm-hmm. into a hotel. We had about 12 different families that offered to put us up. But, again, right. I just lost my mom. I might not mm-hmm. want to get out of bed the next day, let alone have to get up in somebody else's home and have a smile on my face to say good morning. 
I don't want to say good morning. So I couldn't be in yeah. someone else's space. So we chose to live in a hotel. We were in a hotel for seven weeks before our house was restored and we came back home. So when we came back home, I was um, now in a place because for that seven weeks, it was all about meeting with contractors and picking out new color palettes and new this and new that. Everything stayed busy, 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 busy. So when I finally Mm -hmm. got back home is when I had a moment to be like, Oh, yeah, now I'm back in a place of my mom is dead, you know. Right. Dang, my house just got destroyed. Did I really just lose almost all of my possessions? Did that really just happen in one single solitary day? So Mm. in in trying to have a spirit of resolve to kind of ascertain all of these moving pieces that had just occurred, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, right, just right. Mm. So, wow. and a part of the healing was just start writing. But then mm-hmm. God started to reveal that was the plan, right? Because mm-hmm. I said, okay, what am I going to do? I, I don't, you know, I have a business background. And right. before that, I was staying at home with my mom. So I don't know anything about writing. So let's just, let, I, I didn't intend to write a book. I was just going to write letters of gratitude to the people that I felt were so instrumental in helping us. So I wrote the, we were at a La Quinta Inn and Suites um, Mm -hmm. hotel. (laughs) I wrote that CEO to say, hey, this is how your staff treated us while we were there. This is what we went through, and this is how your staff got us through it. Then I wrote Allstate because that was our insurance company. I wrote the CEO of Allstate, hey, this is how your adjustment Mm -hmm. took care of us. And then we were visiting um, a church at the time. My home church was Apostolic Church of God at 63rd and Dorchester under Mm -hmm. Bishop Brazier. But while we were living in a hotel, we were – visiting Family Christian Center under the leadership of Steve Muncy for that seven weeks because it was close to the hotel that we were staying in. So I wrote Pastor Muncy, hey, Mm -hmm. while we were going through this, we were coming to your church, and sometimes the messages you spoke was right directly to our hearts. So those are three letters that I wrote. Three miracles from those three letters manifested. First one came from the La Quinta Inn and Suites. CEO Mm -hmm. wrote me back. I can't believe that you went through all of that and you, you're still going through it. It just happened a few weeks ago and you have the wherewithal to contact us to say, thank you, my God, what you, Mm -hmm. what you still must be experiencing. So we appreciate the fact that you are extending gratitude to us in the midst of your grief. We want to extend more kindness to you to explain to you that that seven weeks that you were staying in our hotel, you were owning points. And those points have accumulated to 10 nights. So whenever you do feel like coming back to a La Quinta Inn and Suites, you can go anywhere in the United States that we have hotel suites. And you know what? I'm going to throw in some upgrades so when you come, you can be in suites. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. So that was 10 nights of free stay at a La Quinta Inn and Suites in suites. So I thought, well, that was real cool. I got to thank you for saying thank you. Right. Then a couple weeks later, we hear from Allstate, and one of the adjusters Mm. was like, "Uh, Claudia, I have gotten accolades from people so high up in the company because you named me in your letter, and they're so taken aback by everything that you guys have gone through, and everybody that you named, you know, we're diving, she even got like a little monetary bonus because of what I had written. So I was like, that's Mm -hmm. good for you, because she's like, but that ain't even why I called you. I called you because Allstate wants to film your story. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, they want to know if they have the permission to send a film crew to your house to film your story. So here comes a freelance producer and a film crew. They set up in my house. They film us for three hours telling the story. And then it was aired by the CEO of Allstate at their quarterly communications meeting. And for all the employees that weren't there, they put it on the intranet to the tune of 70,000 Allstate employees. Wow. And they sent (laughs) us a letter back saying that our story had renewed everybody's sense of pride in how they dealt with their customers because I had named people specifically those Mm -hmm. adjusters and um, 
customer service, we all of them wanted their clients to feel that way about them. So everybody right. amped up their service. Wow. And so they're like, you have no idea how you have helped our company and just sharing your gratitude. So I thought, well, that's so cool. We had a little, they gave us a little DVD copy of it. People would come over. I'd be like, sit down, look at us. Ooh. Our little two, our little two minute little movie that Allstate had made. And then I thought, okay, well, that was cool. That's, that's probably it. But then I, I said to my husband, oh, well, this happened from Laquita and this happened from Allstate. I wonder what's going to happen when Pastor Muncie gets my letter. And he looked at me cross-eyed like, okay, now you're talking about a pastor. <laughs> you want too much. We're right? in church right now. You need to get yeah. over your flesh. <laughs> Come mm-hmm. back to the Lord. So then I thought, okay, well, I guess he's kind of right. So I was going to leave it alone. So we said we're going to visit Family Christian Center one last time. Now that our house is back in order, we're going to resume going back to our home church, Apostolic. And, you know, praise God for what Pastor Muncie did to us. So we're mm-hmm. in that last service. It was a Saturday service, and the baby started to start. She was only 15 months old. So I was like, okay. it's the end of service anyway. Let's go ahead and sneak on out. And my mm-hmm. husband was like, uh-uh, you going to mess up the spirit. This is in the middle of the benediction. Don't move. Don't sit here. She's fine. He pulls out a little dumb, dumb sucker gives that to her to pipe her down. And so the pastor right. saying, God doesn't tell us we're not going to go through things. He doesn't say we're not going to experience any trials and challenges in our life. But what he does mm-hmm. say is that he'll be with us through it. He was like, this is a powerful testimony. Just listen to this. He starts reading my letter from the pulpit. Wow. I cannot believe it. I wow. cannot believe it. And as he is reading the letter, people start standing up. They start throwing their hands up. They start clapping. They start rejoicing in the Lord. So what God had done in my life, and I'm sitting there, and they don't even know it. My husband said, go to the front. Go to the front and let the pastor know you are here. And I was like, I knew I'm not doing that. He's going to be like, who's the nutcase trying to get a sidebar with me in the middle of the benediction? Really? I'm right. not doing that. He said, go to the front. You are not a celebrity. You're not a politician. You are a regular person. God has done a work in our life, and people need to know you are a real person that's sitting amongst them right now. Go. So I mosey on down the aisle. I'm blending. I'm co-mingling with the people that are going to get prayer and (laughs) give their life. (laughs) And then I caught eye contact with the pastor as he's walking and pacing, you know, then the choir is singing, and I and I beckoned him to me when I caught eye contact with him. He comes over, and I said, um, I just want to let you know I'm Claudia. And he looks at me like, honey, I'm trying to recognize you. I just don't. Because, you know, Pat, Family Christian Center is a mega church. He got like 20,000 right. members. And I right. said, I am Claudia. I'm the person whose testimony you just read to the congregation. He turns to the choir, tells him, bring the choir down. Gets on the mic. He's like, I don't know if she's going to be at the other three services that we have. She's here right now. This is Claudia. That was her testimony. People start clapping. People are up there getting prayer. They started hugging me. I have no idea what all this means. I had to go into a quiet place of devotion a couple days later and say, okay, God, mm-hmm. this is three different situations that have manifested in manners. I had no idea what hmm. are you really saying to me i don't understand why are all this happening i'm happy i'm excited but it means something tell help me understand what does this mean so he spoke to me and he said you have the ability to move people through stories it's not of your hmm. own fruition i am anointing right. your ability to share stories this is a fraction of what happened. Mm-hmm. I want you to tell the whole story. Write mm. your testimony. Write yeah. it. And so that was the inspiration behind writing the whole story of my mom and me and the journey from birth all the way up mm. through what I just shared with you, which is the last chapter in the book. Right. Well, let me tell you this, Claudia. I have heard so much stuff from God while you were talking, first off, your story is the Job experience. He (laughs) took everything that you had and gave it to you tenfold. And then Mm. uh, one thing I learned about my story is I found my purpose through pain. 
you lost your mother and you found your purpose of sharing your story and healing people through writing after the loss of her. So through the pain that you felt from grieving from your mother and your Job experience, you were able to help others and find your purpose as well. So yeah. people don't realize that the pain that we go through, the trials and tribulations, the tests that we have are ways of God trying to see if we learn the lesson that he's teaching us. And so mm-hmm. many times we go through some of the same t- trials and tests because we didn't learn it the first time. Right. So for you to have that relationship with him where you can hear his voice and he can tell you what your purpose is, and for him to confirm it three times that this right. is what you're supposed to be doing. But then, like you, even when God shows up, sometimes we don't really believe it because you ask your husband, I wonder what the pastor going to do with my letter. And then as soon as he did it, you was like, no, nah, I don't want to go up there. So even <laughs> when we ask for something, we sometimes get afraid of what's coming because we don't know what the unknown is. Yes. But your story has definitely shed light on the fact that there is you can find your purpose through pain. So for people out there who have gone through something and don't understand why, just be still, go to your quiet place like Claudia did, and let the Lord tell you what he wants you to do. And if you're paying attention, he'll show you like he confirmed the three ways for you. But I heard that we have a caller. So, Justin, our engineer, are they ready? Caller, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, how are you? Tell us your name. This is Pamela Hughes. Hello, Cherie. Hi, Tam. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Hello, Claudia. Hi. Hi, Pamela. Thank you for calling in. You're welcome. I was just listening. I uh, was trying to remember. I'm not feeling my best right now. My arm is in a lot of pain. I took some medication. But mm-hmm. I heard she was talking about your mother and uh, how she loved all of you all. My mother had a singer. She had mm-hmm. eight children. She said, I love all of you, but I treat you according to your attitude. Mm-hmm. Because we all had different personalities. Mm-hmm. And by being eight, she always said, some will, some won't, some can't. And it's true, but I'm glad yeah. to see that you learned through your trials and tribulations and you made it through. Uh, I want to ask you, how was your mother at that time when she was going through this marriage? What was her age? You know what? She was so, oh, my gosh. I want to say maybe, okay, let me get this. Let me get my math right, y'all. Okay. <laughs> she had me, I want to say she had me when I was 17. Okay. So I think she was 23 or 24 years old at the time that my little sister was killed. Mm. Oh, my God. So she had you at 17, right? Yeah. She was going to make mistakes. She was going to go through a lot of things. And uh, sometimes when you don't know Christ or have him in your life, I'm not making an excuse for a past because he said a A blind man couldn't lose his way. So we have no excuses. But when you're young, you have to give a pass to certain things. And Cherie knows personally because I have a niece that's Mm -hmm. young and did some of the same things, still Mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. But we pray for her. And by Mm -hmm. us having her children, we're giving them the guidance that they need and and putting them in a God-fearing way. So I always... My nephew, great nephew, he has a saying, and Cherie knows him. He said, Auntie mm-hmm. Pam, he said, I'm going to grow up and be a great man. I said, you are, Jason? He said, I'm going to have a job, I'm going to get married, and I'm going to stay in the church. <laughs> and by him saying that and following us, because I mm-hmm. listened to your voice as you was talking, Claudia, you went through a lot. But that's okay. It's good to go through things. That'll make you trust God the older you get. And you'll send that down to your children. So mm-hmm. sometimes we don't know our path or why things come our way. It's not for us to understand it all. But just know that God is yet able. Because listening to the way you talk, I really commend you. You did excellent. 
You really Thank have. You. I, you're so welcome. I had both of my parents. They worked hard. They were together. We was all in the same house. I don't know how it feels to have a parent on drugs or anything, but I saw it as I was mm-hmm. growing up with some of the neighbors and right. some of their children. And my mother told us, see how blessed you are, because that could be you. Yeah. And it mm-hmm. could have been us. Now, don't get me wrong. As we got grown, we changed. Right. We adapt our own ways. We do our own thing. But I can say this much out of eight of us, nobody went to jail. Nobody got on drugs. But we had our own okay. issues. We did right. have yep. that. But both of you all, and Cherie, I know this for a fact. And I always tell Cherie, I'm so proud of her. God knows I am. I love her with all my heart. And Claudia, you Thank did you. a wonderful job. You made it. Thank you, you made so it. much, Pam. Oh, you are well, so you. welcome. Yeah. Thank you for call, listening and calling in. We really appreciate it. And for giving really us those, those gems, too. Those deposits in our spirit. Praise God. I received it. Yes. Well, Claudia, this has gone. This conversation has gone so fast because it was so enlightening and helpful to all of us. So, as we prepare to wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity to tell the people about your books and where they can find them and how they can reach you through social media. Yes, absolutely. I um, I'm on social media three different places. My just just my name, Claudia Parker. You can friend me if you like. I am also on um, social media under Becoming a Mother While Losing My Own, which is the title of my book. It can be found in Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, Walmart, all the places that books are sold. And uh, my portraits website is ClaudiaParkerPortraits.com, and my Five Minutes of Faith series is there, which is um, I explained how I had written a book but after mm-hmm. I wrote the book, I became a newspaper reporter. And then wow, after okay. just one year of being a newspaper reporter, I received my own column. And I did that for five years. And just April of last year is when I stopped working for the paper. And when I stopped working for the paper, I missed sharing people's stories. And so I mm-hmm. did not leave that newspaper on my own, the budget and funding was cut for the commentary that I was writing for. So Mm -hmm. I had to resign amid there was no money to be able to pay me. I had the option of staying on with no compensation or, you know, choosing to go because they didn't Mm -hmm. have compensation. So I said, yeah, no, I'm not going to work for free. But I missed (laughs) it so much. So God said, well, you're still a journalist. You're a journalist with a camera in your hand. Just right. use what you have. And so I mm-hmm. started sharing people's stories through five-minute documentaries called Five Minutes of Faith. And those mm-hmm. documentaries are on my website. And Cherie is going to be yes. my next guest. Yes. And yes. that show is going to air the first Sunday of April. So I hope everyone will tune in on April 7th so you can hear Cherie's testimony on five minutes of faith well thank you for that plug because that transitions me right into mine so i want to thank you so much claudia for being here i really appreciate it and i will talk to you soon thank you for having me have a great rest of your day you too so as claudia said i will be on five minutes of faith in april i will share that all with you But tomorrow, on Sunday, from 3 o'clock to 5 p.m., I will be doing a panel discussion underneath the head live on friendship. So you can find tickets at eventbrite.com. They're just $10. So grab your best friends, your buddies, your sisters. And we have a male on the panel, so we'll get to talk about can men and women be friends. So go to my page underneath the head, Facebook, or ShereeSimmons.com and click the link in order to get your tickets for tomorrow. I want to thank everyone for tuning in as we discuss mother-daughter relationships with Claudia. Thank you to Pam for calling in. Next week's topic will be about young ladies at all times. Stay tuned to my page underneath the hat 
com, so I can tell you about what I'm doing with my mentoring program. You'll get to hear from some of those girls as well. Until then, this is Underneath the Hat, an affiliate of Visual Broadcasting and the Talk Radio and TV Network, LLP. My name is Cherie Simmons, and remember to take care of yourself underneath the hat. Thank you for tuning in to Underneath the Hat's radio show. We will see you here again next Saturday at 10 o'clock a.m. Central Time. Follow Cherie on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Underneath the Hat, and visit her website, CherieSimmons.com. Always remember to take care of yourself underneath the hat. See you next week.